What does the future hold? Where can we find certainty in a world of uncertainty? The Book of Revelation provides hopeful answers for today, tomorrow, and forever. Join Mark Finley, author and world-renowned speaker, on a journey into the future with Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. The book of Revelation not only shares God's insight regarding the future, but it reveals God's plan for your life today. It not only reveals the description of prophetic beasts and symbols and helps us to understand where this world is going, but it speaks to our hearts, leading us to deeper commitment, faith, and closer to Christ today. In this presentation, we're going to focus on how this book can change your life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the book of Revelation. Thank you that it is a book that speaks to our present needs. It's a book that is life-changing. It's a book that reveals your plan not only for tomorrow, but your plan for today. As we journey through its pages in this presentation, help us to sense your life-changing power in Christ's name. Amen. My topic is Revelation's answer for society's crumbling values. Have you noticed that there are dramatic changes taking place in our society? Earth-shaking changes are occurring. The home today is under assault. The family is under attack. I remember when I was a boy growing up more years ago than I would like to remember. I remember the refuge and security in my own home, in my own family. Can you think back to your first day of school? For me, that was well more than uh, about 65 years ago, my first day of school. And I remember going to school, I mean, I was nervous. I didn't want to be away from my father, my mother. My, my dad worked nights, so he'd sleep in the morning when he came home. And we just had a, a very close home. My mother and father walked me to school that first day. I get in school and about two hours in, I mean, I wasn't going to stay there. And I raised my hand and said, teacher, yes, can I go to the bathroom? She let me go to the bathroom, walked to the bathroom, looked around, ran home, came through that door, and my father woke up. He said, son, well, you know, what, what's going on here? I thought you were in school. My mother said, what am I? I said, I can't go to school, mom. I can't go to school. And, you know, I remember it like it was yesterday. My mother just threw her arms around me and said, son, it'll be okay. You stay home today and we'll get you back tomorrow. My father said, let's do something together today. You know, I had a home that was a place of refuge, a home that was security. And that's what home is all about. It's a place where children can be hugged by their parents. It's a place of laughter and joy. But too many homes are no longer at that place of laughter and joy. Too many homes have gone through very dramatic changes. They've not become the secure places that heaven intends them to be. They've become places of conflict. They've become places of strife. And today, homes are no longer places of refuge. They are places that have been invaded by the enemy, places that have been attacked by the attacker, when you look at home today, often children are left to get something quick, some hurried meal, and home has just become a dropping off place where people eat quickly before the next event or they sleep. They're more like hotels than genuine homes. Many a mom and many a dad are involved in multitasking, trying to do two or three things at once, and at times, in this hectic, rushed society, children, family values evaporate. Divorce is rampant. Kids often left on their own with eyes glued to their iPads. Do you know that the average teenager today sends over 3,000 texts every single month? It is quite astonishing. That average is about 100 texts a day. I don't know how it can be possible, but that's what the statisticians tell us. When you look out at what's taking place in the world today through television and the Internet, excessive violence, sex, and a total of moral decency, 
and morality have invaded our homes. Our homes are being invaded. Our homes are being attacked. Divorce, commonplace. Violence, murder, immorality through the internet and through television. iPads invading our homes. Many a kid is glued to the TV screen while their parents are out and away from the home. Today, the question becomes, how can you be moral in, in an immoral world? How can you preserve decency? How can you have honesty and integrity and ethics? How can you have purity? How can you have kindness and love in a very violent world, in a world of competing values? How can you protect your home, your family, and your own life and your own mind? You know, the average 18-year-old has witnessed 200,000 violent acts on television and movies, including 40,000 murders. And it is really striking when you see the impact of mass media in blunting our finer sensibilities, in hardening our hearts toward violence, in making us think that immorality and sexual immorality in particular is of no consequence at all. What is it? that's going on in our society. Without a moral compass, our society is thrown into a state of confusion. Too often people have this idea that um, there really is no morality. You have your right, I have my right. You have your truth, I have my truth. You have your so-called morals, I have my so-called morals. There is the idea that there is no moral compass, no specific direction in life. The Bible makes it plain, though, in Proverbs 28, verse 26, it says, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Here is precisely the problem with our society. Men and women have thrown out the moral compass that God has given them. They've thrown out God's law. There's no standard higher than their own mind to govern their actions. There's nothing more than their own heart to give them a sense of what's right and wrong. But the Bible says, Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So one cannot trust a fallen nature to lead that individual into paths of righteousness or morality. The scripture goes on to say in Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. We've sown the wind of violence on television, and we are reaping the whirlwind of violence in our society. We've sown the wind of immorality and sexual adultery and impurity on television, and we are reaping that whirlwind of gonorrhea and syphilis and sexually transmitted diseases and broken homes in our society. As Scripture says, he that trusts his own heart is a fool. As Scripture says, we've sown the wind and we're reaping the whirlwind. We've sown the wind in what's happening in our society. Crime becomes commonplace. When a child looks at television and sees 200,000 violent acts, it's easy for them to become desensitized toward violence and simply go out and commit those heinous violent acts themselves. How do you protect moral values in an immoral world? Is there a moral compass to guide us by? Is there some north star to guide us by? Ships lost at sea at night are guided often by a star, the north star. Where is that north star to guide us today. Let's go back to the book of Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, and Jesus has a moral compass for us. Jesus has a north star to guide us by. Revelation 14, verse 6, we're studying this message in the heart of the book of Revelation. Then I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. This gospel is to go to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying, fear God, that is, obey God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven, earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. Now, notice it says the hour of God's judgment has come. 
judgment implies moral responsibility. Judgment says you're responsible. Fear God. That's obey God, the Scripture says. Give Him glory. Why? Why do we obey God? Because we are morally responsible for the actions that we have in the light of the judgment. The judgment calls us to accountability. We don't act the way we do merely because of our genetics. We don't act the way we do merely because of our environment. We don't act the way we do merely because we've been shaped that way by our parents. We act the way we do because of our choices. You know, too many people try to make many excuses. You know, I, I, I know I have a problem with alcohol, but my father had a problem with alcohol. My grandfather had a problem with alcohol. Certainly, genetics and environment plays a part in the way we act. But we can choose. We can choose to reach out to Christ and through His power make a difference in our lives. We are the arbiters of our own destiny. Somebody says, I'm involved in drugs, but you should see my neighborhood. It's so poverty-stricken, and I've been influenced. You can be influenced by the power of Jesus Christ. You see, that's what judgment is all about. Judgment says you can choose. Judgment says you're responsible for your actions. Judgment says you are the arbiter of your destiny. Somebody says, well, sure, I've been in and out of prison, but my environment, my neighborhood, there's something beyond your neighborhood. It is your choice. The society we live in is a society that largely says you are not responsible for your actions. Nobody is responsible for what they do according to the popular mores of society. In fact, that's part of the evolutionary hypothesis. The evolutionary hypothesis says we are simply in large protein molecules, we're advanced animals, and we've been shaped by our environment to behave the way we do. It's called behaviorism in uh, psychological thought. But the good news is that God has given us the capacity to choose. The good news is that God has given us the freedom of choice. The good news is that we are not like little leaves blowing in the autumn breeze with every wind of societal trends. Judgment implies responsibility and it implies moral choices. Now, God's law is the basis of all morality. It's the standard of all judgment. Is there some moral compass to guide our lives by? There is. Is there some ethical standard to direct our lives? There is. It is God's law. God's law wasn't simply written for a bygone generation. It wasn't written for a group of what some people called nomad Jewish tribes. God's law is the very foundation of God's character, and God's law is the very basis of all ethical morality. James chapter 2, verse 12 says, So speak and so do, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Now, notice two things that are quite fascinating. First, we're judged by the law. Somebody says, I thought we were saved by grace. We are. We are saved by the grace of God. But there must be some basis of judgment. And if you're not going to judge people based on their works in harmony with the law, what are you going to judge by? So grace is so good that it works. Grace always leads to obedience, never leads to to disobedience. But the phrase that I'm interested in here is the law of liberty. So God's law is freeing. For example, in Exodus 20, verse 13, it says, thou shalt not kill. You can look at that as negative, but in a real sense, it's positive. In other words, the law that says thou shalt not kill protects human life. It regards the sanctity of human life. It protects each of us, young and old, from violence. It protects us from abuse. Take the law, for example, that says thou shalt not commit adultery. That law is not to restrict our freedom, but it's to enhance our freedom. It protects the family. It protects husband and wife relationships. It protects moral purity. It inspires happiness and joy. It encourages family values. What about the commandment that says thou shalt not steal? What if there were no commandment that says thou shalt not steal? That would mean that anything you had in society, somebody else could take. 
society would be in chaos if you just didn't have these three of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. You see, human laws are often based on the divine law of God and the very foundation of God's government and the very foundation of all moral society is based on the principles of the Ten Commandments. Without the Ten Commandments there would be absolutely chaos in society, robbery and immorality and stealing and uh, murder would be much more common than they are today. The book of Revelation points us to the very throne of God and it says, Revelation 11, verse 19, then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. So John says, I looked up into heaven and there in heaven I saw the ark of the covenant. And what was in that ark of the covenant in the earthly sanctuary? Remember the sanctuary had three parts. There was the court where sacrifices were offered. There was the holy place where the priest brought the blood after the sacrifice was offered, sprinkled it before the veil. In that holy place was the altar of incense. There was in that first apartment the table of showbread. In that first apartment of the sanctuary there was the golden candlestick. But beyond that veil in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. And in that Ark of the Covenant was the very law of God. So the Bible says, I saw heaven opened and I saw this Ark of the Covenant and I saw the Ten Commandment law written with the finger of God. You see that Ark of the Covenant with the two angels, golden angels overlooking it with the law of God inside it. That Ark of the Covenant between the angels was the Shekinah glory of God. That represents the very throne of God. And there at God's throne we have as the basis of His throne His law. So his law certainly has not been done away with because it's a transcript of his character. It tells us about our loving God and what he's like. And it also is the foundation of his throne. It's the foundation of his government throughout the entire universe and it's the foundation of all moral law. The Ark of God's Covenant contains God's unchangeable, God's eternal, God's law. God's law is the very foundation of His very throne. Now, judgment and law are part of the gospel. If you do away with the law of God, you then say there is no moral responsibility, so there is no judgment. So law and judgment are really part of the gospel because if there is no law, then there can't be any sin. And if there's no sin, there's no accountability. And if there's no judgment and no law, then why would you need a Savior? Why would you need the gospel? Here in 1 John 3, verse 4, the Bible puts it this way. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. Now, sin is not what you and I think it is. I mean, in other words, sin is not something that we define. It's something that God defines. A person says, well, you know, I, I don't have a good marriage relationship, so I'm kind of running around with somebody else, my secretary, a working associate, somebody I met at a party. But, but God understands I don't have a good marriage relationship, so that's okay, and I don't think it's sin. Look, my friend, whether you think it's sin or not doesn't make any difference. Sin is breaking God's law. One of God's laws says thou shalt not commit adultery. I've had young people that have wondered, well, can I have relations with my girlfriend? We're going to get married someday, and, and I can have relations outside of marriage, but I don't think that's wrong. Is it, Pastor? It is. Sin is not how you define it. Sin is how God defines it. Somebody said, well, you know what? I'm, I just occasionally maybe... Um, uh, cheat on my income taxes and you know occasionally I may may take something out of a store you know I bought three sweaters but I slipped another jumper another sweater in there is that sin because think of how much those store owners make you don't define sin God does if you steal, that's sin. Dishonoring your parents, that's sin. Sin is defined not by human beings, not by our mind, but by God Himself. Sin, according to the Bible, is breaking God's law. Sin is turning our backs on the moral principles of the universe. God's law is His eternal moral standard, which defines sin and establishes our accountability to God. So the law of God is not some legalistic requirement to restrict our freedom. It is rather given by a loving God. 
the book of Revelation, opens its pages and shares with us that God still has a standard and wise parents direct their children to the living Word of God, to the law of God as the code of conduct. Grace always enables us to keep and obey God's law. God's law is the pathway to freedom. It is the pathway to genuine happiness. Openly, knowingly violating God's law is the pathway to disaster, not the pathway to happiness. Now, love always leads to obedience. Love never leads to disobedience. I've had people say, well, all you have to do is love. And if you just love God, uh, He requires nothing else. Does that imply that you love Him and you don't have to obey Him? What if a little child said, oh, Mommy, I love you. Mommy, I love you. Daddy, I love you. Would you take out the trash, son? Would you pick up your room, son? Oh, Mommy or Daddy, I love you. But I don't think I love you that much. You see, love always is manifest in action. Love is never some silly sentimental thing that we can't define. Love always reveals itself in the way we act. That's why Jesus said, John 14, verse 15, if you love me, do what? Do what? Keep my commandments. Jesus did not say, if you love me, you don't have to keep my commandments. Jesus didn't say, if you love me, don't worry about my commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, do what? Do what, everybody? If you love me, keep my commandments. Love naturally leads to obedience. No, I obey God, not in order to be saved, not in order to earn His love, but I obey God because I am saved and because I have been loved. So when I'm saved by Christ, that leads me naturally to obey Christ. When I'm loved by Christ, that naturally leads me to respond to Christ in love. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 puts it this way, Now, by this we know that we know Him. Now, what's the evidence that we know Christ? What's the evidence that He's living in our heart? If we keep His commandments. So, the keeping of the commandments of God is evidence par excellence that we have committed our lives to Christ and we genuinely love Him. Now, notice what the Bible says. Now, notice I didn't say this. These are not my words. These are the Bible's words. He who says, I know Him. So, this person says, oh, I, I know Christ. I love Christ. He who says, I know Him and does not keep His commands is a what? What does it say? Is a what? Is a liar and the truth is where? Is it in Him? And the truth is not in Him. In other words, if I say, I love Christ, and all I want to do is follow Christ, but yet I don't live an obedient, godly life. If my life does not reflect my love, then that love is not genuine at all. Now, grace and law are not contradictory ideas. There are some people that have the idea that law is an Old Testament idea and grace is a New Testament idea. They have the mistaken idea that people in the Old Testament are saved by law and people in the New Testament are saved by grace. Someday when we get up in heaven, am I going to see Moses up there and Daniel up there and Jeremiah and Isaiah from the Old Testament and say, hey guys, how were you guys saved? Moses says, I was saved by the law. Daniel says, I was saved by the law. And I see Paul and James and John, how were you saved by grace? Are we going to have two methods of salvation in heaven? Not at all. Moses was saved by grace. The Bible says, Titus 2, verse 12 and 14, the grace of God that brings salvation appears to all men. So, Moses was saved by grace, and Jeremiah was saved by grace, and Paul and James and John were saved by grace. Do you say, how could the Old Testament people be saved by grace? Christ hadn't come. Every sacrifice they offered looked forward in anticipation to the Christ that was to come. So their faith reached forward to the cross. Our faith reaches backward to the cross. But it's the same faith that we exercise, that Abraham exercised. The Bible says Abraham was saved by faith. So they exercised faith to receive grace. We exercise faith to receive grace. Grace and law are not contradictory ideas. 
Now, what's the role of God's law and what's the role of grace? Well, let's notice they have different roles. They're not contradictory, they're complementary. What's the role of God's law? Romans chapter 3, verse 20, by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, the law reveals what sin is. If I did not have the law, I would not know what sin is. Now, if you do away with the law, but the Bible says by the law is the knowledge of what? Sin. So, if you do away with the law, there is no sin. For example, if I'm traveling down the highway and on this interstate and I'm going a hundred miles an hour, and a police stops me. Now, don't worry, this preacher's not tra going to travel 100 miles an hour. But I'm driving down, the police stops me. He says, what are you doing? You're speeding. You're, you're, the speed limit is 70. You're 30 miles an hour over. So if there's a law, I'm accountable to judgment for breaking that law. But what if there is no law? What if I'm on the Autobahn in Germany where there are no speed limits and I'm going 100? What's going to happen? Well, if I don't get in a wreck because I'm, not, uh, because I'm driving so fast, I'm not going to be picked up by the police. Why not? There is no law. So if you do away with the law, you do away with sin. Now let's take that a step further. The Bible says in Romans 7 verse 7, I would not have known sin except through the what? The law. So just like Paul says in Romans 3.20, by the law there is a knowledge of sin. We can't know sin except by the law. So the law reveals what sin is. I would have not known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. So you cannot know what sin is unless it is defined by the law. If you do away with the law, you do away with sin. Now, what's the role of grace? The role of grace is to save us. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, for by grace you have been, what? Saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So, we are not saved by the law. The law reveals to us what sin is. Grace is God's mercy. Grace is God's pardon. Grace is is God's forgiveness. Grace has to do with God's power. Grace has to do with God's love. Maybe this illustration will help us. Let's suppose that I'm out working on my car, and as I'm working on my car, some grease spatters up, and it hits me in the nose, hits me on the cheek, and I got this grease all over me. And I, I don't realize it so much. And my wife calls me, Mark, Mark, it's time for supper. I come in the house and I got this grease. She looks at me and says, you got grease all over your face. I say, darling, I don't have grease on my face. She said, you better go look in the mirror. I go look in the mirror. Wait a minute, my wife's right. All, uh, she's right. I got this grease, but I don't like that mirror. I'm going to do away with it. I'm going to smash it. Does smashing the mirror take the grace, take the the oil off my face. Does smashing the mirror take the oil off my face? No, you say, that's craziness. It just reveals what's there all the time. That's the function of the law. It reveals what's there all the time. But what do I need? I need soap. I need soap to cleanse this dirty face of mine. What is the role of grace? Grace is God's mercy and pardon that washes me clean and empowers me to live a new life. Does grace do away with God's law? Romans 3 verse 31 puts it this way, do we then make void the law through faith? What does Paul say? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Anybody that says faith or grace does away with the law of God disagrees with the Apostle Paul. Because what does Paul say? Do we then make void the law? That is, do we do away with the law through faith? What does he say? Certainly not. Does that seem tenuous? Not at all. Paul's very clear. He says, we establish the law. In other words, my faith leads me to accept God's grace that cleanses my heart, and that leads me to obey God's law. Jesus put it as plainly as he can put it when he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, 
Do not think that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. I've come not to destroy, but to do what? Fulfill. Did Jesus come to do away with the law that said, thou shalt not commit adultery? Did he? He came to fulfill it or broaden the claims of the law, and Jesus didn't do away with the law. He said anybody that looks at a woman and gazes, lingering with lust in his heart, has broken that commandment. That isn't to say that the lustful look is worse says the lustful act. It's not to say that at all, because the lustful act has social consequences, breaks up family, but it is to say it's breaking that commandment. Did Jesus say that, did Jesus come to do away with the commandment that says thou shalt not kill, so that now you can go out and kill? Not at all. What did he say? He broadened that commandment, and he said, if you have anger in your heart, you've broken the commandment. Does that mean anger is as bad as killing, so you might as well go out and kill somebody? Not at all. That's a misinterpretation totally. But what it does mean is that the angry thought leads to the angry act, that you can break the commandment not only by the physical act, but you can break the commandment as well by the thought in the mind of, of, of anger. Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I came to do what? Fulfill it. Jesus is saying, I've come to fulfill the law full of meaning. I've come to fulfill it full of purpose. He fills it full of purpose by giving us a pure mind and taking away adulterous thoughts. He fills it full of purpose by taking anger out of our heart and helping us have lives of gentleness and kindness. Jesus puts it very plain when he says in Romans 6 verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under law, but under grace. Somebody says, that, that's it right there. Uh, uh, we're not under the law, Pastor Mark. We're under grace. That means we don't have to keep the law. Is that what the text says? No, the text doesn't say that. Let's look at the text carefully. Sin won't have dominion over you. When does sin have dominion over you? What is sin? It's lawlessness. So sin has dominion over you when you are breaking God's law. Notice it says you're not under law, but under grace. Now, just look at the text. Does the text say we're not under the law? You know, I have many, many texts, many audiences that say, oh yeah, it says that we are, we are under the law. What does it say? You're not under the law, you're under grace. It doesn't say you're under the law, it says you're not under the law, you're under grace. What does it mean to be not under the law? What does that mean? Does it mean you're not under the jurisdiction of the law, therefore you can break the law? Or does it mean you're not under the law as a method of salvation? See, if you take the text in context, sin shall not have dominion over you. In other words, you're not going to be out there breaking God's law recklessly, for you're not under the law. You're not under the law as a method of salvation. You're under the grace of method of salvation. And when you are under the grace method of salvation, you are cleansed and pardoned by that grace. That dynamic grace enters into your life and leads you to a life of obedience. Sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the law, but under grace. What does it mean to be under grace? To be under grace means that I accept Christ's pardon, I receive Christ's forgiveness, and I'm filled with Christ's power. So the law is not my method of salvation. Grace is my method of salvation. But the grace that pardons me is the grace that transforms me. The grace that frees me from the guilt of sin is the grace that frees me from the shackles of sin. When I come to Jesus, we come just as we are, with all of our sin, with all of our guilt, with all of our shame, with all of our condemnation. But we do not stay as we are. He changes us. He makes us over again. He leads us to be obedient to His law. The law, like the mirror, reveals our need. But Christ cleanses us from the sin of our life. Psalm 19 verse 7 says, the law of the Lord is what? Perfect, converting the soul. The law is a perfect transcript of God's character. How does it convert my soul? It drives me to Jesus, just like looking in the mirror drives me to get some soap because I see I'm dirty. So the law converts my soul in the sense, not that it has power, but in the sense it shows me my lack of power, it shows me my sin, and it drives me 
to Jesus Christ. It drives me to the cross of Calvary. It drives me to kneel there and say, Jesus, let your blood drops fall on me and cleanse me. On the cross I see his love. On the cross I see his grace. On the cross I see his pardon. On the cross I see his mercy. On the cross I see freedom from the condemnation of the law. At the cross I say, Jesus, if you've done this much for me, all I want to do is kneel before your cross and obey you now and forever. Somebody says, but Pastor Mark, I have a question. I love questions. What's your question? Didn't a rich young ruler came to Jesus and say to him, what are the great commandments in the law? And didn't Jesus say love? Let's go back and look at that. The scribe came to Jesus. This teacher of the law came to Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 to 40, and he says to Jesus, teacher, what's the great commandment in the law? Now, why do you think he asked Jesus that? He did to test him. He wanted to see if he could back Jesus into the corner. What does Jesus say? He says, Jesus said to him, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then Jesus goes on to say, this is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. The Pharisee said, the scribe said, the lawyer said, that's it. It's love. He understood what Jesus was doing. Jesus was taking the Ten Commandment law and summarizing them. Some people say that Jesus was introducing a new commandment here, but look what he says. Next verse, on these two commandments, that's loving God, loving your fellow man, hang all the law in the prophets. In other words, the entire Ten Commandment law can be summarized in these two phrases. The first four commandments can be summarized in loving God. The last six commandments can be summarized in loving your fellow man. The entire law can be summarized in one word, love. In fact, Jesus was quoting from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 says, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. It's a summary of the Ten Commandments. Leviticus 19, 18 says, love your neighbor as yourself. So when Jesus summarized the whole law, it's in one word, love. When he breaks down the two tables of the law, it's love to God, the first four commandments, love to your fellow man, the next six. So the commandments are codified love. The commandments reveal what loving people do. Love, they love God and they love their fellow man. Loving people don't in any way want to steal from their neighbors. Loving people don't want any way to break the marriage tie and commit adultery. Loving children want to honor their parents. Loving people who love God don't want to have any other gods before them. Loving people don't want to take his name in vain. So the Ten Commandments reveal how loving people respond in given situations. The grace of Christ does not change the Ten Commandment law written by God's own finger on tables of stone. God did not write his law on parchment to be consumed. He didn't write it on sand to be washed away. He wrote it with his own finger on tables of stone. And if God wrote his finger on tables of stone, he wrote it permanently to last not only for a few years or a few generations, but to last forever. And God's Ten Commandment law is for people in every race, culture, creed, and background. God's Ten Commandment law is the moral code of conduct for every society. God's Ten Commandment law reveals how people saved by grace respond to Him in loving obedience. You know, when you look at the Ten Commandment law itself, and you see its introduction, you see that the Ten Commandment law really was to give us freedom and not to keep us in bondage. Look what it says in Exodus 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So they were coming out of bondage, and God gave them the law as an illustration of their freedom. But somebody says, are the Ten Commandments relevant for us today? The Ten Commandments speak with relevance to your life and mine. They speak with purpose to your life and mine. The first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. In an age of false gods, 
in an age when sports stars become our gods and so singers become our gods and entertainers become our gods and the Hollywood icons become our gods, God says, you shall have no other gods before me. This commandment speaks with relevance in our generation at a time when men and women make graven images are their material possessions. God says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. In other words, worship me directly. The first commandment says, worship me exclusively. There's nobody like our God. Our God is an awesome God. The first commandment says, have no other gods before me. Worship him directly, the, exclusively. The second commandment says, Thou well, shalt not make any other graven image. Worship Him directly. Come directly to God. Third commandment says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain at a time when the name of Jesus. That lovely name, that magnificent name that's been dragged through the dust in vile epithets and in curse words, the Bible says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. In other words, also, another way to break that commandment is to pretend you're a Christian, really not be one. In other words, don't live a hypocritical life. Live in harmony with Christ and His will and His commandments. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God says, remember, most of the world is forgotten. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. At a time when people are racing on, filled with stress and anxiety and worry, tension leading to coronary heart disease, God says, come, come. The commandments are relevant. The Sabbath is relevant. God says, come. Come and find rest and security in your Creator each Sabbath at a time when parents are defying the commands of their parents, where children are defying the commands of their parents, at a time when children often turn their backs on rebellion and what their parents say means little. God says, honor your father and mother. At a time of beating and killing and bombs dropping, in a time of taking the life of the young unborn so indiscriminately, God says, thou shalt not kill. The commandment speaks with relevance. Murder on television, violence in our society, terrorism, free abortions taking place, indiscriminately, and God says, human life is sacred. And at a time of blatant, wanton sexual adultery, God calls us to purity. The commandments speak with relevance to this generation at a time when people think very little of stealing, very little of taking things from others that don't belong to them. God's Word still speaks, thou shalt not steal. In a time of criticism and gossip and lying about other people and destroying their reputations, the tabloid newspapers are full of it. What does it say in the Scripture? Exodus 20, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. To destroy your neighbor's reputation is a serious offense against God. These commandments are relevant. Think if we only spoke good of others. Think if we never, never spoke critical words or lied, told half-truths about others. Think of the positive human relationships that would take place. Think of the positive human relationships if we were filled with purity, filled with kindness, filled with love. You see, the Ten Commandment law leads us not to be selfish or jealous of what others have. Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet. What a society we would have if we worshiped God directly if we worship God exclusively, if His name were honored, if the Sabbath were kept and people felt restful and peaceful, what a society we would be in if children honored their parents and there was a strong family unit. What a society we would have if we respected the goods of others and we respected the lives of others and we protected the lives of others. What a society we would have if we, if we maintain moral purity. No divorce. Kindness and love reigns, and we're not coveting. God is calling us back, back to the keeping of His law. He's calling us from the majority, 
calling us from the crowd, calling us by His grace and through His power to live godly, obedient lives. The Bible says in Psalm 111, verse 7 to 9, the works of His hands are verity and justice. All His precepts are sure. Speaking of His commandments, they stand fast forever and ever. He has commanded His covenant forever. Down through the centuries, God's Ten Commandment law speaks with relevance to bring joy and happiness and meaning and purpose to his people. Satan lost heaven because of disobedience. He disobeyed God and lost heaven. Adam and Eve lost Eden because of disobedience. And many a man, many a woman will lose heaven again they'll lose the joy of that Edenic home in the future because of disobedience. God says, here's God's desire for your heart. Here's God's desire for your life. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. This is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. What is the covenant? What is this new covenant? Is it to do away with God's law? Not at all. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. What is the new covenant promise? The new covenant promise is God's law in our mind so we know it. God's law in our heart so that we love it. We love God's law. Saved by grace, all we want to do is obey God's law. God will have a last day people who have his law written in their hearts, written in their minds. Where are God's last day people today, you say? How can I find God's last day people today? Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience or the endurance of the saints, the believers. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Jesus has an end time. Jesus has a last day people. And he says, here they are. They're saved by faith. The faith of Jesus lives in their heart. The faith of Jesus is a dynamic principle that changes their life. And they are led to live obedient lives. If you want to find God's end time people, find a people saved by grace. Find a people that are living by the faith of Jesus Christ in their hearts as a dynamic principle that leads them to keep God's law. That leads them to be obedient to God's commandments. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14 puts it this way. Blessed. I want to be blessed, don't you? How many want to be blessed? Blessed are those that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city, clothed with His righteousness, enrobed with His glory, immersed in His grace. They do His commandments according to the book of Revelation. Jesus reaches out to you. And Jesus says to you, my friend, come. Kneel before me. Confess anything not in harmony with my will. Commit deeply in your heart that you desire to keep my commandments. I'll give you that strength. I'll give you that courage. Many years ago, Dwight L. Moody was a great preacher. Preached all across America. Preached in England. Thousands and thousands came to hear Moody preach. Moody had quite a reputation, and very often people pointed forward to Moody's life, and pointed out Moody's life to their children as an example. The story is told of a mother who brought her young son to meet Dwight Moody. And as the boy came up, the mother smiled and said to Mr. Moody, Mr. Moody, this is my boy, I'll call him John. This is my boy, John. Mr. Moody, I'd love you to meet him. John, shake Mr. Moody's hand. And the boy clenched his fist and he put his hands behind his back. The mother was quite embarrassed. Meeting a famous man like that, meeting a renowned man like that, meeting a man that had shaken two continents for God and her son has his hands behind his back. Son, shake Moody's hand. And the boy took his hand out with a fist like this. Son, open your hand. Son, why are you being so defiant? Son, shake the great preacher's hand. The boy had his hand in his fist. His, his made a fist out of his hand. The woman took her, his fingers and began to peel them back and open them up. And the boy had a few marbles in his hand. The boy thought that Dwight Moody was going to take his marbles. 
He didn't want to give up his marbles. What marbles are you holding on to? What are you clinging to in your hand? When you look at God's law, have you been living in harmony with its principles? Have you been knowingly, willingly breaking God's law? Jesus has opened your hand. I want to embrace you. I want to take you by the hand. I want to lead you from here to eternity. Open up your hand. Don't hold on to those cheap, tawdry marbles anymore. I've got so much more for you. Jesus reaches out to you right now. And will you say all to Jesus, I surrender. I surrender all, Jesus. Listen as Celestine sings and open your heart to this Christ. want to be very practical. How do you surrender all? What does it mean to surrender all for somebody? These next few moments are going to change your life. For somebody, these next few moments are going to transform your life. You say, but you know, I have this relationship, I could never surrender it. I have this habit, I could never surrender it. This habit has chained me. This habit has shackled me. I've tried to give it up before and I can't. I'm in this relationship and I can't get out. I seem bound. I'm not sure that I want to give up the things that I'm doing because at times they are so attractive to me. Listen to me, friend. First, don't worry about giving up things. Give yourself to Jesus. He will take care of the things. 
What do you receive when you give yourself to Jesus? You receive peace. Your heart is flooded with his peace. You receive a sense of the forgiveness of your sins. The guilt is gone. You receive a new power into your life that is life-changing and it's radical and it's life-transformational. You receive the new joy that there is purpose for your life, there's a plan for your life, and Christ has your best interest in view. You, reserve, you receive the hope of heaven and the glory that you can live with Christ forever and ever and ever and ever. What do I give up? I give up a sin-polluted heart. I give up a confused life. I give up when I surrender myself to Christ. I give up my own ways. I come to Jesus. And what I receive is so much greater right now. Would you like to bow your head with me? Right now, would you like to say, Jesus, I'm giving my whole self to you. All to Jesus I surrender. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that coming to Christ isn't giving up things. It's giving up ourself. It's giving to you our very life. And when we do that, in exchange for a sin-polluted heart, we receive the grace and strength and pardon and forgiveness of Christ. In exchange for purposelessness and meaninglessness in life, we receive direction in our life. In exchange for not having much assurance for the future, we receive the joy and the hope of eternity. We thank you so much for everything you give us. We come to you and we give you our lives this very moment, knowing that you've said, Him that cometh to me, I'll in no wise cast out. In Christ's name, amen. Have the assurance, my dear friend, that if you have made that decision in your home, if you have made that, that decision in your hotel room to come to Christ right now, that your hand is in the hand of Christ. He will never, ever, ever let you go. He'll never turn his back on you. Have the joy of his peace. Stay with us as we journey through the book of Revelation together and understand more deeply its prophecies. Join us for our next telecast on Revelation's Ancient Discoveries.